Warning, the video you are about to watch will contain language and scenarios of a highly adult nature and is therefore not intended for children under the age of 18. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what's up guys? This is Couch Potato Mike, back in the book club for the gripping conclusion of Grey by E.L. James. Four chapters today, because three of them are pretty damn short, actually. Uh, and at the end of this, I will be announcing the winner of the giveaway. So stay tuned for that. Uh, now, before we get into this, I want to thank everybody who tunes into these. Thank you for your support. Um, we didn't actually get that many people that entered the contest. So you have a So those of you that did enter have got a pretty good chance of winning, I might, I must say. I must say. Uh, now, this is uh, only people who entered uh, before f uh, on Friday, February the 4th, and before are going to be eligible. So if you entered on Saturday or Sunday, uh, because this, this is going to air on Monday, I believe, Monday or Tuesday, uh, but sorry. What can I say? I don't do these videos live. I've learned my lesson about uh, doing uh, subscriber giveaways live, celebrating getting to a certain number, because I've seen so many people really get screwed by their own subs. So it'd be like somebody hit like a million subs, and then all of a sudden they're doing it live, and then all their subs start dropping just to be dicks about it. So yeah, I don't, homie don't play that. If you get that reference right there that I just said, leave it in the comments down below. I like interacting with you guys. Uh, anyway, so just remember to like and subscribe because we're already very well on the road to 500 subs, and that's going to be freaking amazing. I've got a prize uh, laid out for that one, but we'll get into that later. So let's go ahead and finish up Gray by E.L. James, starting on Chapter 21. Which takes place on Sunday, June the 5th of 2011. I gaze up at the bedroom ceiling. Sleep eludes me. I'm tormented by Anna's fragrance, which still clings to my bed sheets. I pull her pillow over my face to breathe in her scent. It's torture. It's heaven. And for a moment, I contemplate death by suffocation. Get a grip, Gray. I rerun the morning's events in my head. Could they have unfolded any differently? As a rule, I never do this because it's a waste of energy, but today I'm looking for clues as to where I went wrong. And no matter how I play it out, I know in my bones we would have reached this impasse. Whether it was this morning, or in a week, or a month, or a year... Better that it happened now before I inflicted any further pain on Anastasia. I think of her huddled in the in her little room. I think of her huddled in her little white bed. I can't picture her in the new apartment. I've never been there. But I imagine her in that room in Vancouver where I once slept with her. I shake my head. That was the best night's sleep I'd had in years. The radio alarm reads two in the morning. I have lain here for two hours, my mind churning. I take a deep breath, inhaling her scent once more, and I close my eyes. Mommy can't see me. I stand in front of her. She can't see me. She's asleep with her eyes open or sick. I hear a rattle. His keys. He's back. I run and hide and make myself small under the table in the kitchen. My cars are here with me. Bang! The door slams shut, making me jump. Through my fingers I see Mommy. She turns her head to see him. Then she's asleep on the couch. He's wearing his boots with his shiny buckles and standing over Mommy, shouting. He hits Mommy with a belt. Get up! Get up! You're one fucked up bitch! You're one fucked up bitch! Mommy makes a noise, a wailing noise. <coughs> Stop. Stop hitting Mommy. Stop hitting Mommy. 
I run at him and hit him and I hit him and I hit him. But he laughs and smacks me across the face. No, Mommy shouts. You one fucked up bitch. Mommy makes herself small, small like me, and then she's quiet. You are one fucked up bitch. You are one fucked up bitch. You are one fucked up bitch. I'm under the table. I have my fingers in my ears and I close my eyes. The sound stops. He turns and I can see his boots as he stomps into the kitchen. He carries the belt, slapping it against his leg. He is trying to find me. He stoops down and grins. He smells nasty, of smoking and drinking and bad smells. There you are, you little shit. A chilling wail wakes me. I'm drenched in sweat and my heart is pounding. I sit bolt upright in bed. Fuck. The eerie noise was from me. I take a deep breath, steadying breath, trying to rid my memory of the smell of body odor and cheap bourbon and stale camel cigarettes. You are one, you are one fucked up son of a bitch. And his words ring in my head. Like his. Fuck. I couldn't help the crack whore. I tried. Good God, I tried. There you are, you little shit. But I could help Anna. I let her go. I had to let her go. She didn't need all this shit. I glance at the clock. It's 3.30. I head into the kitchen after drinking a large glass of water. I make my way to the piano. I wake again with a jolt and it's light. Early morning sunshine fills the room. I was dreaming of Anna. Anna kissing me, her tongue in my mouth, my fingers in her hair, pressing her delectable body against me, her hands tethered above my, her head. Where is she? One sweet moment I forgot all that transpired yesterday, that it floods back. She's gone. Fuck. The evidence of my desire presses into the mattress, but the memory of her bright eyes clouded with hurt and humiliation as she left soon solves that problem. Feeling like shit, I lie on my back and stare at the ceiling, arms behind my head. The day stretches out before me, and for the first time in years, I don't know what to do with myself. I check the time again, 5.58. Hell, I might as well go for a run. Procofive's arrival of the Montagues and Capulets blares in my ears as I pound the sidewalk through the early morning quiet 4th Avenue. I ache everywhere. My lungs are bursting, my head is throbbing and yawning. Dull ache of loss eats away at my insides. I cannot run from this pain, though I'm trying. I stop to change the music and drag precious air into my lungs. I want something violent. Pump it by the black-eyed peas, yeah. I pick up the pace. I find myself running down Vine Street, and I know it's insane, but I hope to see her. As I near her street, my heart races still harder, and my anxiety escalates. I'm not desperate to see her. I just want to check that she's okay. No, that's not true. I want to see her. Finally on her street, I pace past her apartment building. All is quiet. An Oldsmobile trundles up the road. Trundles. Two, dogs, two dog walkers are out, but there's no sign of life from inside her apartment. Crossing the street, I pause on the sidewalk opposite, then duck into the doorway of an apartment building to catch my breath. The curtains of one room are closed. The others open. Perhaps that's her room. Maybe she's still asleep, if she's there at all. A nightmare scenario forms my mind. She went out last night, got drunk, met someone. No! Bile rises in my throat. The thought of her body in someone else's hands, some asshole basking in the warmth of her smile, making her giggle, making her laugh, making her cum. It takes all my self-control not to go barging through the front door of her apartment and check that she's there and on her own. You brought this on yourself, Gray. Forget her. She's not for you. I tug my Seahawks cap low over my face and sprint on down Western Avenue. My jealousy is raw and angry. It fills the gaping hole. I hate it. 
it stirs something deep in my psyche that I really don't want to examine. I run harder, away from the memory, away from the pain, away from Anastasia Steele. It's dusk over Seattle. I stand up and stretch. I've been at my desk in my study all day, and it's been productive. Roz has worked hard, too. She's prepared and sent me a first draft business plan and a letter of intent to SIP. At least I'll be able to keep an eye on Anna. The thought is painful and appealing in equal measure. I've read and commented on two patent applications, a few contracts, and a new, and a new design spec. And while lost in the detail of those... I have not thought about her. The little glider is still on my desk, taunting me, reminding me of happier times, like she said. I picture her standing in the doorway of my study, wearing one of my t-shirts, all long legs and blue eyes, just before she seduced me. Another first. I miss her. There, I admit it. I check my phone, hoping in vain, and there's a text from Elliot. Dear hot shot, I respond. No, busy. Elliot's response is immediate. Fuck you then. Yeah, fuck me. Nothing from Anna. No missed call, no email. The nagging pain in my gut intensifies. She's not going to call. She wanted out. She wanted to get away from me and I can't blame her. It's for the best. I head to the kitchen for a change of scenery. Gail is back. The kitchen has been cleaned and there's a pot bubbling on the stove. Smells good, but I'm not hungry. She walks in while I'm eyeing what's cooking. Good evening, sir. Gail. She pauses, surprised by something. Surprised by me? Shit, I must look bad. Chicken chasseur? She asks, her voice uncertain. Sure, I mutter. For two? She asks. I stare at her and she looks embarrassed. For one. Ten minutes, she says, her voice wavering. Fine, my voice is frigid. I turn to leave. Mr. Gray, she stops me. What, Gail? It's nothing. Sorry to disturb you. She turns to the stove to stir the chicken, and I head off to have another shower. Christ, even my staff have noticed there's something rotten in the state of fucking Denmark. Chapter 22, which takes place on Monday, June the 6th, 2011. I dread going to bed. It's after midnight and I'm tired, but I sit at my piano playing the Bach Marcello piece over and over again. Remembering her head resting on my shoulder, I can almost smell her sweet fragrance. For fuck's sake, she said she'd try. I stop playing and clutch my head in both hands, my elbows hammering on two discordant chords as I lean on the keys. She said she'd try, but she fell at the first hurdle. Then she ran. Why did I hit her so hard? Deep inside I know the answer. Because she asked me to, and I was too impetuous and selfish to resist the temptation. Seduced by her challenge, I seized the opportunity to move us on to where I wanted us to be. And she didn't say for word. And I hurt her more than she could take when I promised her I would never do that. What a fucking fool I am. How could she trust me after that? It's right that she's gone. Why the hell would she want to be with me anyway? I contemplate getting drunk. I have not been drunk since I was 15. Well, once when I was 21. I loathe the loss of control. I know what alcohol can do to a man. I shudder and snap my mind shut to those memories and decide to call it a night. Lying in my bed, I pray for a dreamless sleep, but if I am to dream, I want to dream of her. <clears throat> Mommy is pretty today. She sits down and lets me brush her hair. She looks at me in the mirror and she smiles her special smile. Her special smile for me. There is a loud noise, a crash. He's back. No. Where the fuck are you, bitch? Got a friend in here. A friend with dough. Mommy stands and takes my hand and pushes me into her closet. I sit on her shoes and try to be quiet and cover my ears and close my eyes tight. The clothes smell of Mommy. I like the smell. I like being here, away from him. 
He is shouting. Where's the little fucking runt? He has my hair and he pulls me out of the closet. Don't want you spoiling the party, you little shit. He slaps mommy hard on her face. Make it good for my friend and you get your fix, bitch. Mommy looks at me and she has tears. Don't cry, Mommy. Another man comes into the room. Big man with dirty hair. The big man smiles at Mommy. I am pulled into the other room. He pushes me onto the floor and I hurt my knees. Now what am I going to do with you, you piece of shit? He smells nasty. He smells of beer and he's smoking a cigarette. I wake. My heart is hammering like I've run 40 blocks chased by the hounds of hell. I vault out of bed, pushing the nightmare back into the recesses of my consciousness, consciousness and hurry to the kitchen to fetch a glass of water. I need to see Flynn. The nightmares are worse than ever. I didn't have nightmares when I slept with Anna beside me. Hell, it never occurred to me to sleep with any of my subs. Well, I never felt the inclination. Was I worried that they might touch me in the night? I don't know. It took an inebriated innocent to show me how restful it could be. I'd watched my sub sleep before, but it was always as a prelude to waking them for some sexual relief. I remember gazing at Anna for hours when she slept at the Heathman. The longer I watched her, the more beautiful she became. Her flawless skin luminous in the soft light, her dark hair fanning out on the white pillows and her eyelashes fluttering while she slept. Her lips were parted and I could see her teeth and her tongue when she licked her lips. It was a most arousing experience, just watching her, and when I finally went to sleep beside her, listening to her even breathing, watching her breasts rise and fall with each breath, I slept well, so well. I wander into my study to pick up the glider. The sight of it elicits a fond smile and comforts me. I feel both proud to have made it and ridiculous for what I'm about to do. It was her last gift, gift to me. It was her last gift to me. Her first gift being what? Of course, herself. She sacrificed herself to my need, my greed, my lust, my ego, my fucking damaged ego. Damn, will this pain ever just stop? Feeling a little foolish, I take the glider to bed with me. What would you like for breakfast, sir? Just coffee, Gail. She hesitates. Sir, you didn't need your dinner. And? Maybe you're coming down with something. Gail, just coffee, please. I shut her down. This is none of her business. Her lips thin, but she nods and turns to the gagia. I head to the study to collect my papers for the office and look for a padded envelope. Sorry guys, I had to pause for a minute. My microphone was trying to come unscrewed from my desk. That'd have been horrible. I call Roz from the car. Great work on the SIP material, but the business plan needs some revision. Let's offer. Christian, this is fast. I want to move quickly. I've emailed you my thoughts on the offering price. I'm in the office from 7.30. Let's meet. If you're sure, I'm sure. Okay, I'll call Andrea to schedule. I have the stats on the Detroit v Savannah. Bottom line, Detroit. I see. Shit. Not Savannah. Let's talk later. I hang up. I sit brooding in the back of the Audi as Taylor speeds through the traffic. I wonder how Anastasia will be getting to work this morning. Perhaps she bought a car yesterday, though somehow I doubt it. I wonder if she feels as miserable as I do. I hope not. Maybe she's realized that I was it was a, I was a ridiculous infatuation. She can't love me. It's certainly not now, not after all I've done to her. No one's ever said they love me except mom and dad, of course, but even then it was out of their sense of duty. Flynn's nagging words about unconditional unconditional parental love, even for kids who were adopted, ring in my head. But I've never been convinced. I've been nothing but a disappointment to them. Mr. Gray? Sorry, what is it? 
Taylor has caught me unawares. He's holding the car door open, waiting for me with a look of concern. We're here, sir. Shit, how long have we been here? Thanks. I'll let you know what time for this evening. Focus, Gray. Andrea and Olivia both look up as I come out of the elevator. Olivia flutters her eyelashes and tucks a strand of hair behind her ear. Christ, I'm done with this silly girl. I need HR to move her to another department. Coffee, please, Olivia, and get me a croissant. She leaps up to follow my orders. Andrea, get me Welch, Barney, then Flynn, then Claude Bastille on the phone. I don't want to be disturbed at all, not even by my mother, unless... Unless Anastasia Steele calls, okay? Yes, sir. Do you want to go through your schedule now? No, I need coffee and something to eat first. I scowl at Olivia, who is moving at a snail's pace toward the elevator. Yes, Mr. Gray. Andrea calls after me as I open the door to my office. From my briefcase, I take the padded envelope that holds my most precious possession, the glider. I place it on my desk, and my mind drifts to Miss Steele. She'll be starting her new job this morning. Meeting new people, new men, the thought is depressing. She'll forget me. No, she won't forget me. Women always remember the first men they fuck, don't they? I've all, I'll always hold a place in her memory for that alone. But I don't want to be a memory. I want to stay in her mind. I need to stay in her mind. What can I do? There's a knock at the door and Andrea appears. Coffee and croissants for you, Mr. Gray. Come in. As she scurries over to my desk, her eyes dart to the glider, but wisely she holds her tongue. She places breakfast on my desk. Black coffee. Well done, Andrea. Thanks. I've left messages for Welch, Barney, and Bastille. Flynn is calling back in five. Good. I want you to cancel any social engagements I have this week. No lunches, nothing in the evening. Get Barney on the phone and find me the number for a good florist. She scribbles furiously on her notepad. Sir, we use Arcadia's roses. Would you like me to send flowers for you? No, give me the number. I'll do it myself. That's all. She nods and leaves promptly, as if she can't get out of my office fast enough. A few moments later, the phone buzzes. It's Barney. Barney, I need you to make me a stand for a model glider. Between meetings, I call the florist and order two dozen white roses for Anna to be delivered to her home this evening. That way, she won't be embarrassed or inconvenienced at work. And she won't be able to forget me. Would you like a message with the flowers, sir? The florist asks. A message for Anna? What to say? Come back. I'm sorry. I won't hit you again. The words pop unbidden to my head, making me frown. Um, something like, Congratulations on your first day at work. I hope it went well. I spy the glider on my desk. And thank you for the glider. That was very thoughtful. It was. It has a pride of place on my desk, Christian. I'm sorry to break in the middle of this, but I've read this line so many times, and I'm pretty sure it's backwards. It's supposed to be place of pride on my desk, not pride of place. That doesn't make any sense unless it's a British thing. If any of you are British, let me know if you actually say pride of place over there. I. It it just doesn't it doesn't sit right with me. Christian. The florist reads it back to me. Damn, it doesn't express what I want to say to her at all. Will that be all, Mr. Gray? Yes, thank you. You're welcome, sir, and have a nice day. I look daggers at the phone. Nice day, my ass. Hey, man, what's eating you? Claude gets up from the floor, where I've just knocked him flat on his lean, mean rear end. You're on fire this afternoon, Gray. He rises slowly with the grace of a big cat reassessing its prey. We are sparring alone in the basement gym at Gray House. I'm pissed off, I hiss. His expression is cool as we circle each other. Not a good idea to enter the ring if your thoughts are elsewhere, Claude says, amused but not taking his eyes off me. I'm finding it helps. More on your left. Protect your right. Hand up, Gray. He swings and hits me on the shoulder, almost knocking me off balance. Concentrate, Gray. None of your boardroom bullshit in here. Or is it a girl? Some fine piece of ass finally cramping your cool? He sneers, goading me. It works. I middle kick to his side and drop punch once, then twice, and he staggers back, dreadlocks flying. Mind your own fucking business, Bastille. 
Whoa, we have found the source of the pain, Claude crows in triumph. He swings suddenly, but I anticipate the action and block him, thrusting up with a punch and a swift kick. He jumps back this time, impressed. Whatever shit's happening in your privileged little world, Gray, it's working. Bring it on. Oh, he is going down. I lunge at him. The traffic is light on the way home. Taylor, can we make a detour? Where to, sir? Can you drive past Miss Steele's apartment? Yes, sir. I got used to this ache. It seems to be ever-present, like tinnitus. In meetings, it's muted and less obtrusive. It's only when I'm alone with my thoughts that it flares up and rages inside me. How long does this last? As we approach her apartment, my heartbeat spikes. Perhaps I'll see her. The possibility is thrilling and unsettling, and I realize that I have thought of nothing but her since last night. Since she left. Her absence is my constant companion. Drive slowly, I instruct Taylor as we near the building. The lights are on. She's home. I hope she's alone. Missing me. Has she received the flowers? I want to check my phone to see if she sent me a message. But I can't drag my gaze away from her apartment. I don't want to miss seeing her. Is she well? Is she thinking about me? I wonder how her first day at work went. Again, sir? Taylor asks as we slowly crew pa cruise past and the apartment disappears from view. <sighs> no, I exhale. I hadn't realized I'd stopped breathing. As we head back to a scala, as we head back to a scala, I sift through my emails and text, hoping for something from her. But there's nothing. There's a text from Elena. You okay? I ignore it. It's quiet in my apartment. I'd not really noticed before. Anastasia's absence has accentuated the silence. Taking a sip of cognac, I wander listlessly into my library. It's ironic. I never showed her this room, given her love for literature. I expect to find some solace in here because the room holds no memories of us. I survey all my books, neatly shelved and cataloged, and my eyes stray to the billiard table. Does she play billiards? I don't suppose she does. An image of her spread eagle over the green bays springs to my mind. There may not be any memories in here, but my mind is more than capable and more than willing to create a vivid, vivid erotic image of the lovely Miss Steele. I can't bear it. I take another swig of cognac and head out of the room. Chapter 23 which takes place on Tuesday, June the 7th of 2011. We're fucking, fucking hard against the bathroom door. She's mine. I bury myself in her again and again, glorying her, the feel of her, her smell, her taste. Fisting my hands in her hair, holding her in place, holding her ass, her legs wrapped around my waist. She cannot move. She's pinioned by me, wrapped around me like silk, her hands pulling my hair. Oh, yes. I'm home. She's home. This is the place I want to be, inside her. She is mine. Her muscles are tightening as she comes, clenching around me, her head back. Come for me. She cries out and I follow. Oh, yes, my sweet, sweet Anastasia. She smiles, sleepy, sated, and oh, so sexy. She stands and gazes at me, that playful smile on her lips, then pushes me away and walks backwards, saying nothing. I grab her and we're in the playroom. I'm holding her down over the bench. I raise my arms to punish her. Belt in hand, and she disappears. She's by the door, her face white, shocked and sad, and she's silently drifting away. The door has disappeared, and she won't stop. She holds out her hands in entreaty. Join me, she whispers, but she's moving backward, getting fainter, disappearing before my eyes, vanishing. She's gone. No. I shout, no! But I have no voice. I have nothing. A mute. Mute. 
Again. I wake, confused. Shit. It's a dream. Another vivid dream. Different, though. Hell. I'm a sticky mess. Briefly, I feel the long-forgotten but familiar sense of fear and exhilaration. But Elena doesn't own me now. Jesus H. Christ, I've come for Team UFSA. This hasn't happened to me since I was, what, 15, 16? I lie back in the darkness, disgusted with myself. I drag my t-shirt off and wipe myself down. There's semen everywhere. I find myself smirking in the darkness, despite the dull ache of loss. The erotic dream was worth it. The rest of it? Fucking hell. I turn over and go back to sleep. He is gone. Mummy is sitting on the couch. She is quiet. She looks at the wall and blinks sometimes. I stand in front of her, but she doesn't see me. I wave, and she sees me, but she waves me away. No, Maggot, not now. He hurts Mommy. He hurts me. I hate him. He makes me so bad. It's best when it's just Mommy and me. She is mine, then. My Mommy. My tummy hurts. It is hungry again. I am in the kitchen looking for cookies. I pull the chair to the cupboard and climb up. I find a box of crackers. It is the only thing in the cupboard. I sit down on the chair and open the box. There are two left. I eat them. They taste good. I hear him. He's back. I jump down and run to my bedroom and climb into bed. I pretend to be asleep. He pokes me with his finger. Stay here, you little shit. I'm going to fuck your bitch of a mother. I don't want to see your fuck ugly face for the rest of the evening, understand? He slaps my face when I don't reply. Or you get the bird, you little prick. No. No, I don't like that. I don't like the bird. It hurts. Got it, retard. I know he wants me to cry, but it's hard. I can't make the noise. He hits me with his fist. Startled awake again, I lie panting in the pale dawn light, waiting for my heart rate to slow, trying to lose the acrid taste of fear in my mouth. She saved you from this shit, Gray. You didn't relive the pain of these memories when she was with you. Why did you let her leave? I glance at the clock. 5.15. Time for a run. Her building looks gloomy. It's still in shadow, untouched by the early morning sun. Fitting, it reflects my mood. Her apartment is dark inside, yet the curtains to the room I watched before are drawn. It must be her room. I hope to God that she's sleeping alone up there. I envisage her curled up on her white iron bed, a small ball of Anna. Is she dreaming of me? Do I give her nightmares? Has she forgotten me? I've never felt this miserable, not even as a teenager. Maybe before I was a gray, my memory spirals back. No, no, not awake as well. This is too much. Pulling my hood up and leaning against the granite wall, I'm hidden in the doorway at the building opposite. The awful thought crosses my mind that I might be standing here in a week, a month, a year. Watching, waiting just to catch a glimpse of the girl who used to be mine. It's painful. I've become what she always accused me of being. Her stalker. I can't go on like this. I have to see her. See that she's okay. I need to erase the last image of her heart, humiliated, defeated, and leaving me. I have to think of a way. <clears throat> Back at Escala, Gail watches me impassively. I didn't ask for this. I stare at the omelet she's placed in front of me. I'll throw it away then, Mr. Gray, she says and reaches for the plate. She knows I hate waste, but she doesn't quail at my hard stare. You did this on purpose, Mrs. Jones, interfering woman. And she smiles, a small, victorious smile. I scowl, but she's unfazed, and with the memory of last night's nightmare lingering, I devour my breakfast. Can I just call Anna and say hi? Would she take my call? My eyes wander to the glider on my desk. She asked for a clean break. I should honor that and leave her alone, but I want to hear her voice. For a moment, I contemplate calling her and hanging up just to hear her speak. Fuck. 
Christian, Christian, are you okay? Sorry, Roz, what was that? You're so distracted, I've never seen you like this. I'm fine, I snap. Shit, concentrate, Gray. What were you saying? Roz, Roz eyes me suspiciously. I was saying that SIP is in more financial difficulty than we thought. You sure you want to go ahead? Yes. My voice is vehement. I am. The team will be here this afternoon to sign the heads of agreement. Good. Now, what's the latest on the proposal for Avid Kavanaugh? <laughs> I stand brooding, staring down through the slated wooden blinds as Taylor... Let me try that again, guys. I stand brooding, staring down through the slated wooden blinds at Taylor, who is parked outside Flynn's office. It's late afternoon, and I'm still thinking about Anna. Christian, I'm more than happy to take your money and watch you stare out the window, but I don't think the view is the reason you're here, Flynn says. When I turn to face him, he's regarding me with an air of plight at... <laughs> I'm talking too fast, guys. I'm so sorry. Stopped up this morning. When I turn to face him, he's regarding me with an air of polite anticipation. I sigh and make my way to his couch. The nightmares are back. Like never before, Flynn lifts a brow. The same ones? Yes. What's changed? He cocks his head to one side, waiting for my response. When I remain mute, he adds, Christian, you look as miserable as sin. Something's happened. I feel like I did with Elena. Part of me doesn't want to tell him, because then it's real. I met a girl, and she left me. He looks surprised. Women have left you before. Why is this different? I stare at him blankly. Why is it different? Because Anna was different. My thoughts blur together in a colorful, tangled tapestry. She wasn't a submissive. We had no contract. She was sexually inexperienced. She was the first woman I wanted more from than just sex. Christ, all the firsts I experienced with her. The first girl I'd slept beside. The first virgin. The first to meet my family. The first to fly a Charlie Tango. And the first I took soaring. Yeah, different. Flynn interrupts my thoughts. It's a simple question, Christian. A misser. His face remains kind and concerned, but he gives nothing away. You've never missed any of the women you were involved with previously? No. So there was something different about her, he prompts. I shrug, but he persists. Did you have a contractual relationship with her? Was she a submissive? I'd hoped she would be, but it wasn't for her. Flynn frowns. I don't understand. I broke one of my rules. I chased this girl, thinking that she'd be interested. It turned out it wasn't for her. Tell me what happened. The floodgates open, and I recount the past month's events, and from the moment Anna fell into my office to when she left last Saturday morning. I see. You certainly packed a lot in since we last spoke. He rubs his chin as he studies me. There are many issues here, Christian, but right now the one I want to focus on is how you felt when she said she loved you. I inhale sharply, my gut tightening with fear. Horrified. I whisper. Of course you did, he shakes his head. You're not the monster you think you are. You're more than worthy of affection, Christian. You know that. I've told you often enough. It's only in your mind that you're not. I give him a little gaze, ignoring his platitude. And how do you feel now, he asks. Lost. I feel lost. I miss her. I want to see her. I'm in the confessional once more owning up to my sins, the dark, dark need that I have for, as if she were an addiction. So, in spite of the fact that, as you perceive it, she couldn't fulfill your needs, you miss her? Yes. It's not just my perception, John. She can't be what I need her to be, and I can't be what she wants me to be. Are you sure? She walked out. She walked out because you belted her. If she doesn't sh share your tastes, can you blame her? No. Have you thought about trying a relationship her way? What? I stare at him, shocked. He continues. Did you find sexual relations with her satisfying? Yes, of course. I snap irritated. He ignores my tone. Did you find beating her satisfying? Very. Would you like to do it again? 
Do that to her again? And watch her walk out again? No. And why is that? Because it's not her scene. I hurt her. Really hurt her. And she can't. She won't. I pause. She doesn't enjoy it. She was angry. Really fucking angry. Her expression, her wounded eyes will haunt me for a long time. And I never want to be the cause of that look again. Are you surprised? I shake my head. She was mad, I whisper. I'd never seen her so angry. How did that make you feel? Helpless. And that's a familiar feeling, he prompts. Familiar? How? What does he mean? Don't you recognize yourself at all, your past? This question knocks me off balance. Fuck, we've been over and over this. No, I don't. It's difficult. The relationship I had with Mrs. Lincoln was completely different. I wasn't referring to Mrs. Lincoln. What were you referring to? My voice is a pen drop, quiet, because suddenly I see where he's going with this. You know. I gulp for air, swamped by the impotence and rage of a defenseless child. Yes, the rage. The deep, infuriating rage. And fear. The darkness swirls angrily inside me. It's not the same, I hiss through gritted teeth as I strain to hold my temper. No, it's not, Flynn concedes. But the image of her rage comes unwelcome to my mind. This is what you really like? Me? Like this? It dampens my anger. I know what you're trying to do here, Doctor, but it's an unfair comparison. She asked me to show her. She's a consenting adult, for fuck's sake. She could have safe-worded. She could have told me to stop, but she didn't. I know. I know. He holds, up his, he holds his hand up. I'm just callous. I'm just callously illustrating a point, Christian. You're an angry man, and you have every reason to be. I'm not going to rehash all that with you now. You're obviously suffering, and the whole point of these sessions is to move you to a place where you're more accepting and comfortable with yourself. He pauses. This girl, Anastasia, I mutter petulantly. Anastasia. She's obviously had a profound effect on you. Her leaving has triggered your abandonment issues and your PTSD. She clearly means much more to you than you're willing to admit to yourself. I take a sharp breath. Is that why this is so painful? Because she means more? So much more? You need to focus on where you want to be, Flynn continues. And it sounds to me like you want to be with this girl. You miss her. Do you want to be with her? Be with Anna? Yes, I whisper. Then you have to focus on that goal. This goes back to what I've been banging on about for our last few sessions. The SFBT. If she's in love with you, as she told you she is, she must be suffering too. So I repeat my question. Have you considered a more conventional relationship with this girl? No, I haven't. Why not? Because it's never occurred to me that I could. Well, if she's not prepared to be your submissive, you can't play the role of dominant. I glare at him. It's not a role, it's who I am. From nowhere, I recall an earlier email to Anastasia. My words. What I think you fail to realize is in the Dom-Sub relationship, it is the sub who has all the power. That's you. I'll repeat this. You are the one with all the power, not I. If she doesn't want to do this, then neither can I. Hope stirs in my chest. Could I? Could I have a vanilla relationship with Anastasia? My scalp prickles. Fuck. Possibly. If I could, would she want me back? Christian, you have demonstrated that you are an extraordinarily capable person in spite of your problems. You are a rare individual. Once you focus on a goal, you'll dri you drive ahead and achieve it, usually surpassing all of your own expectations. Listening to you today, it is clear you were focused on getting Anastasia to where you wanted her to be, but you didn't take into account her inexperience or her feelings. It seems to me you've been so focused on reaching your goal that you missed the journey that you were taking together. The last month flashes before me. Her tripping into my office, her acute embarrassment at Clayton's, her witty, snarky emails, her smart mouth. 
her giggle, her quiet fortitude and defiance, her courage, and it occurs to me that I have enjoyed every single minute, every infuriating, distracting, humorous, sensual, carnal second of her. Yes, I have. We've been on an extraordinary journey, both of us. Well, I certainly have. My thoughts take a darker turn. She doesn't know the depths of my depravity, the darkness of my soul, the monster beneath. Maybe I should leave her alone. I'm not worthy of her. She can't love me. But even as I think the words, I know that I don't have the strength to stay away from her, if she'll have me. Flynn summons my attention. Christian, think about it. A time is up now. I want to see you in a few days and talk through some of the other issues you mentioned. I'll have Janet call Andrea and arrange an appointment. He stands and I know it's time to leave. You've given me a lot to think about, I tell him. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't. Just a few days, Christian. We have so much more to talk about. He shakes my head and gives me a reassuring smile and I leave with a small blossom of hope. Standing on the balcony, I survey Seattle at night. Up here, I'm at one remove away from it all. What did she call it? My ivory tower? Normally, I find it peaceful, but lately my peace of mind has been shattered by a certain blue-eyed young woman. Have you thought about trying a relationship her way? Flynn's words taunt me, suggesting so many possibilities. Could I win her back? thought terrifies me. I take a sip of cognac. Why would she want to come back? Could I ever be what she wants me to be? I won't let go of my hope. I need to find a way. I need her. Something startles me. A movement. A shadow at, my, at the periphery of my vision. I frown. What the? I turn toward the shadow but find nothing. I'm seeing things now. I slug the cognac and head back into the living room. I was mistaken, guys. We actually have five chapters to get through today. I accidentally, I didn't realize the two of them were together, so. But we're almost there. Chapter 24, which takes place on Wednesday, June the 8th of 2011. Mommy, Mommy. Mommy is asleep on the floor. She has been asleep for a long time. I shake her. She doesn't wake up. I call her. She doesn't wake up. He isn't here. And still Mommy doesn't wake up. I'm thirsty. In the kitchen, I pull a chair to the sink and have a drink. The water splashes over my sweater. My sweater is dirty. Mommy is still asleep. Mommy, wake up. She lies still. She is cold. I fetch my blankie and I cover mommy and I lie down on the sticky green rug beside her. My tummy hurts. It is hungry, but mommy is still asleep. I have two toy cars, one red, one yellow. My green car is gone. They race by the floor where mommy is sleeping. I think mommy is sick. I search for something to eat in the icebox. I find peas. They are cold. I eat them slowly. They make my tummy hurt. I sleep beside mommy. The peas are gone. In the ice box is something. It smells funny. I lick it and my tongue sticks. I eat it slowly. It tastes nasty. I drink some water. I play with my cars and I sleep beside mommy. Mommy is so cold and she won't wake up. The door crashes open. I cover mommy with my blankie. Fuck. What the fuck happened here? Oh, the crazy fucked up bitch. Shit. Fuck. Get out of my way, you little shit. He kicks me and I hit my head on the floor. My head hurts. He calls somebody and he goes. He locks the door. I lay down beside mommy. My head hurts. The lady policeman is here. No, no, no. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I stay by mommy. No. Stay away from me. The lady policeman has my blankie. As she grabs me, I scream, Bobby! Bobby! The words are gone. I can't say the words. Mommy can't hear me. I have no words. I wake, breathing hard, 
taking huge gulps of air, checking my surroundings. Oh, thank God, I'm in my bed. Slowly the fear recedes. 27, not 4. This shit has to stop. I used to have nightmares under control, maybe one every couple of weeks, but nothing like this, night after night, since she left. I turn over and lie flat on my back, staring at the ceiling. When she slept beside me, I slept well. I need her in my life, in my bed. She was the date of my night. I'm going to get her back. How? Have you thought about trying a relationship her way? She wants hearts and flowers. Can I give her that? I frown, trying to recall the romantic moment of my, moments of my life. And there's nothing except with Anna. The more. The gliding. The IHOP. I'm taking her up at Charlie Tango. Maybe I can do this. I drift back to sleep and the mantra in my head, she's mine, she's mine. I smell her, feel her soft skin, taste her lips and hear her moans. Exhausted, I fall into an erotic Anna film dream. I wake suddenly, my scalp tingles and for a moment I think whatever's disturbed me is, an, is external rather than internal. I sit up and rub my head and slowly scan the room. In spite of the carnal dream, my body beha has behaved. Elena would be pleased. She texted yesterday, but Elena's the last person I want to talk to. And there's only one thing I want to do right now. I get up and pull on my running gear. I'm going to go check on Anna. Her street is quiet, except for the rumble of the delivery truck and the out-of-tune whistling of a solitary dog walker. Her apartment is in darkness, the curtains to her room closed. I keep a silent vigil from my stalker's hide, staring up at the windows and thinking. I need a plan, a plan to win her back. As dawn lights brighten to her window, I turn my iPod up loud, and with Moby blaring in my ears, I run back to Escala. I'll have a croissant, Mrs. Jones. She stills in surprise and I raise a brow. Apricot preserves? She asks, recovering. Please. I'll heat up a couple for you. Mr. Gray, here's your coffee. Thank you, Gail. She smiles. Is it just because I'm having croissants? If it makes her that happy, I should have them more often. In the back of the Audi, I plot. I need to get up close and personal with Anna Steele to begin my campaign to win her back. I call Andrea, knowing that at 7.15 she won't be at her desk yet, and I leave a voicemail. Andrea, as soon as you're in, I want to run through my schedule for the next few days. There. Step one in my offensive is to make time in my schedule for Anna. What the hell am I supposed to be doing this week? Currently, I don't have a clue. Normally, I'm on this shit, but lately I've been all over the place. Now, I have a mission to focus on. You can do this, Gray. But deep down, I wish I had the courage of my convictions. Anxiety unfurls in my gut. Can I convince Anna to take me back? Will she listen? I hope so. This has to work. I miss her. Mr. Gray, I canceled all your social events this week, apart from the one for tomorrow. I don't know what the occasion is. Your calendar says Portland. That's it. Yes! The fucking photographer! I beam at Andrea and her eyebrows shoot up in surprise. Thanks, Andrea. That's all for now. Send in Sam. Sure, Mr. Gray. Would you like some more coffee? Please. With milk? Yes, latte. Thank you. She smiles politely and leaves. This is it. My inn. The photographer. Now, what to do? My morning has been back-to-back -back meetings, and my staff have been watching me nervously, waiting for me to explode. Okay, that's been my modus operandi for the last few days, but today I feel clearer, calmer, and present, able to deal with everything. It's now lunchtime. My workout with Claude has gone well. The only fly in the ointment is there's no more news about Layla. All we know is that she split up with her husband and could be anywhere. If she surfaces, Welch will find her. I'm famished. Olivia set a plate down on my desk. You sandwich, Mr. Gray? Chicken and mayonnaise? Um, I stare at her. She just doesn't get it. Olivia offers an inept apology. I said chicken with mayonnaise, Olivia. It's not that hard. I'm sorry, Mr. Gray. 
It's fine, just go. She looks relieved but scrambles to leave the room. I buzz Andrea. Sir, come in here. Andrea appears in the doorway, looking calm and efficient. Get rid of that girl. Andrea pulls herself up straight. Sir, Olivia is Senator Blandino's daughter. I don't care if she's the queen of fucking England. Get her out of my office. Yes, sir. Andrea flushes. Get someone else to help you. I offer a gentler tone. I don't want to alienate Andrea. Yes, Mr. Gray. Thank you. That's all. She smiles and I know she's back on board. She's a good PA and I don't want her to quit because I'm being an asshole. She exits, leaving me to my chicken sandwich, no mayo, and my campaign plan, Portland. I know the form of email address for employees at SIP. I think Anastasia will respond better at writing. She always has. How to begin? Dear Anna. Shh. No. Dear Anastasia. Shh. No. Dear Miss Steele. Shit. Half an hour later, I'm staring at a blank computer to screen. What the hell do I say? Come back, please. Forgive me. Shh. I miss you. Shh. Let's try it your way. Shh. I put my head in my hands. Why is this so difficult? Keep it simple, Gray. Just cut the crap. I take a deep breath and tap out an email. Yes, this will do. Andrea buzzes me. Miss Bailey is here to see you, sir. Tell her to wait. I hang up and take a moment, and with my heart pounding, I press send. From Christian Gray, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1405 to Anastasia Steele. Dear Anastasia, forgive this intrusion at work. I hope that it's going well. Did you get my flowers? I know that tomorrow is the gallery opening for your friend's show, and I'm sure that you've not had time to purchase a car. And it's a long drive. I would be more than happy to take you, should you wish. Let me know. Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I watch my inbox, and watch, and watch, my anxiety growing with every second that crawls by. Getting up, I pace the office, but that takes me away from my computer. Back at the desk, I check my email yet again. Nothing. I'm recording! To distract myself, I trace my fingers along the wings of my glider. For fuck's sake, Gray, get a grip. Come on, Anastasia, answer me. She's always been so prompt. I check my watch, 1409. Four minutes, still nothing. Getting up, I pace around the office once more, peering at my watch every three seconds or so it feels. By 2.20, I'm in despair. She's not going to reply. She really does hate me. Who could blame her? Then I hear the ping of an email. My heart leaps into my throat. Hell, it's from Roz, telling me she's gone back to her office. Then, and then it's there, in my inbox, the magical line, from Anastasia Steele. From Anastasia Steele, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1425 to Christian Gray. Hi, Christian. Thank you for the flowers. They are lovely. Yes, I would appreciate a lift. Thank you. Anastasia Steele, assistant to Jack Hyde, editor, SIP. Relief floods through me. I close my eyes, savoring the feeling. Yes! I pour over her email looking for clues, but as usual, I have no idea what the thoughts are behind her words. The tone is friendly enough, but that's it, just friendly. Carpe diem, Gray. From Christian Gray, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1427, Anastasia Steele. Dear Anastasia, what time shall I pick you up? Christian Gray, CEO, Gray Enterprises Holdings, Inc. I don't, I don't have to wait long, quite so long this time. From Anastasia Steele, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1432 to Christian Gray. Jose's show starts at 730. What time would you suggest? Anastasia Steele, assistant to Jack Hyde, editor SIP. We could take Charlie Tango. From Christian Gray, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1434 to Anastasia Steele. Dear Anastasia, Portland is some distance away. I shall pick you up at 545. I look forward to seeing you. Christian Gray, CEO, Great Presence Holdings, Inc. From Anastasia Steele, subject tomorrow, June 8th, 2011, 1438 to Christian Gray. See you then. Anastasia Steele, assistant to Jack Hyde, editor SIP. My campaign to win her back is underway. I feel elated. The small blossom of hope is now a Japanese flowering cherry. I buzz Andrea. 
Miss Bailey went back to her office, Mr. Gray. I know. She emailed me. I need Taylor here in an hour. Yes, sir. I hang up. Anastasia's working for a guy named Jack Hyde. I want to know more about him. I call Roz. Christian? She sounds pissed. Tough. Do we have access to the employee files from SIP? Not yet, but I can get them. Please, today if you can. I want everything they have on Jack Hyde and anyone who's worked for him. Can I ask why? No. She's silent for a moment. Christian, I don't know what's got into you recently. Roz, just do it, okay? She sighs. Okay, now can we have a meeting about the Taiwan shipyard proposal? Yes, I had an important call to make. It took longer than I thought. I'll be right up. When Roz leaves, I follow her out of the office. WSU next Friday, I tell Andrea, who scribbles a reminder in her notebook. And I get to fly... And I get to fly in the company chopper? Roz bubbles with enthusiasm. Helicopter, I correct her. Whatever, Christian. She rolls her eyes as she enters the elevator, and it makes me smile. Andrea watches Roz leave, then gives me an expectant look. Call Stefan. I'll be flying Charlie Tango to Portland tomorrow evening, and I need him to fly her back to Boeing Field, I tell Andrea. Yes, Mr. Gray. I see no sign of Olivia. Has she gone? Olivia? Andrea asks. I nod. Yes. She seems relieved. Where to? Finance. Good thinking. It'll keep Senator Blandino off my back. Andrea looks pleased at the compliment. You're getting someone else to help out here, I ask. Yes, sir. I'm seeing three candidates tomorrow morning. Good. Is Taylor here? Yes, sir. Cancel the rest of my meetings today. I'm going out. Out? She squeaks in surprise. Yes, I grin. Out. Where to, sir? Taylor asks as I stretch out in the back of the SUV. The Mac store. On Northeast 45th? Yes. I'm going to buy Anna an iPad. Leaning back in my seat, I close my eyes and contemplate which app and songs I'm going to download and install for her. I could choose Toxic, I smirk at the thought. No, I don't think that would be popular with her. She'd be mad as hell, and for the first time in a while, the thought of her mad makes me smile. Mad like she was in Georgia. Not like last Saturday. I shift in my seat. I don't want to be reminded of that. I turn my thoughts back to the potential song choices, feeling more buoyant than I have in days. My phone buzzes and my heart rate spikes. Dare I hope? Hey, asshole. Beer? Hell. A text from my brother. No. Busy. You're always busy. Going to Barbados tomorrow. To, you know, relax. See you when I get back. And we'll have that beer. Laters, Lelliot. Safe travels. It's been a diverting evening, filled with music, a nostalgic journey through my iTunes, making a playlist for Anastasia. I remember her dancing in my kitchen. I wish I knew what she'd been listening to. She looked totally ridiculous and utterly adorable. That was after I fucked her for the first time. No, after I made love to her for the first time. Neither term feels right. I recall her impassioned plea the night I introduced her to my parents. I want you to make love to me. How shocked I was by her simple statement, and yet all she wanted was to touch me. I shudder at the thought. I have to make her understand that this is a hard limit for me. I cannot tolerate being touched. I shake my head. You're getting ahead of yourself, Gray. You have to close the deal first. I check the inscription on the iPad. Anastasia, this is for you. I know what you want to hear. The music on here says it for me, Christian. Perhaps this will do it. She wants hearts and flowers. Perhaps this will come close, but I shake my head. Because I have no idea. There's so much I want to say to her if she'll listen. And if she won't, the songs will say it for me. I just hope she allows me the opportunity to give them to her. But if she doesn't like my proposition, if she doesn't like the thought of being with me, what will I do? I might just be a convenient ride to Portland. A thought depresses me as I head toward my bedroom for some much-needed sleep. Do I dare ho to hope? Damn it. Yes, I do. Chapter 25, which takes place on Thursday, June the 9th, 2011. The doctor holds up her hands. 
I'm, n I'm not going to hurt you. I need to check your tummy. Here. She gives me a cold, round, sucky thing that she lets me play with. You put it... You put it on your tummy, and I won't touch you. I can hear your tummy. The doctor is good. The doctor is mommy. My new mommy is pretty. She's like an angel. A doctor angel. She strokes my hair. I like it when she strokes my hair. She lets me eat ice cream and cake. She doesn't shout when she finds the bread and the apples hidden in my shoes. Or under my bed. Or under my pillow. Darling, the food is in the kitchen. Just find me or daddy when you're hungry. Point with your finger. Can you do that? There's another boy. Lillian. He is mean, so I punch him. But my new mommy doesn't like the fighting. There is a piano. I like the noise. I stand at the piano and press the white and the black. The noise of the black is strange. Miss Kathy sits at the piano with me. She teaches the black and the white notes. She has long brown hair as she looks like someone I know. She smells of flowers and apple pie baking. She smells good. She makes the piano sound pretty. She is kind to me. She smiles and I play. She smiles and I am happy. She smiles and she's Anna. Beautiful Anna. Sitting with me as I play a fugue. A prelude. An adagio. A sonata. She sighs, resting her head on my shoulder, and she smiles. I love listening to you play, Christian. I love you, Christian. Anna, stay with me. You're mine. I love you, too. I wake with a start. Today, I win her back. I knew it was coming, it still gave me cold chills, guys. I got goose flesh. Look at that. How fucking awesome is that? Love these books. Love them, love them, love them. Uh, but yeah, no. We did it, guys. We finished Grey. And coming very, very soon. I'm not going to make you guys wait for this, because I can't wait. Uh, we're going to be, uh, st I'm going to be starting darker. To keep the flow going. So stay tuned for that. But now, it is time to announce the winner of my contest. And guess what? I haven't even picked them yet. So, give me just a second, and you'll get to see, uh, I was going to say democracy in action, but we're not actually voting. So, you get to see, uh, randomness in action? Give me a minute, guys. Congratulations to Don Alphonse, the winner of my giveaway. You will be receiving these two wonderful, glorious Funko Pops. You got Harley Quinn here, and you got the Dalek here. Not one, but both. For entering my contest, for being a loyal subscriber, and for the fickled finger of fate picking you out of the... Five people that entered my giveaway. I'll have more people entering as time goes by. I'm sure of it. Uh, but Dawn, yeah, congratulations. Uh, now, the way you're going to get these, uh, they will be mailed to you. Uh, so you need to respond and you need to pay attention. Uh, within five days of the time this uh, video is published, you need to respond to the following email which is couch potato giveaway that c o u c h p o t a t o g i v e a w a y couch potato giveaway at gmail.com uh, respond there with your shipping address i promise i will it will go no further i will not respond to the email though uh, that e this email address is for receiving emails only it's couchpotatogiveaway at gmail.com. Respond there, and I will get those on out to you as uh, soon as I have your uh, soon as I have your address. But I want to thank you guys for coming along this journey with me. 
gray. It's had its ups, it's had its downs, it's had its laugh out loud moments, it's had its tear moments, it's had its angry moments. This is a roller coaster, an emotional roller coaster of a book. And that roller coaster is going to keep on coming. Darker's coming next, guys, so stay tuned for that. So until then, this is Couch Potato Mike. Thanking you guys for subscribing and helping me reach 400. See you again at the 500 subscriber special. It's around the corner. I know it is. Fingers crossed, guys. But if you haven't subscribed, what is keeping you? Please subscribe. Help me get there. So for the Couch Potato Mike YouTube channel, this is Couch Potato Mike reminding you guys that in the end, we're all stories. So let's make them good ones. See you next time, guys. For darker. Or a fun co-pop video, whichever I have a... Uh, um, scheduled next. I lose track sometimes. Bye-bye.